Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Schausman Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rule book that the federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It's complimentary and recorded. We post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. Special thanks to our webinar partner in this series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would, all, we would also like to thank our friends at Open the Part for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jenniferschaus.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jenniferschaus.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Fern Lavallon. His contact information is on the screen. And today we are covering FAR Part 17 with Fern. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really thank you for your participation in the series. The floor is now yours. Please let me know when you are ready for your next slide. Uh, I am ready for my next slide. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to uh, be speaking with you uh, today about FAR Part 17 um, and, uh, and some of the exciting tools available to contracting officers, contracting professionals, and certainly rules and, and options that uh, contractors alike will want to be aware of and very familiar about. Uh, I am a hometown lawyer located here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am a partner, as was mentioned, in uh, the firm, the international firm of Jones Day. Uh, I practice uh, exclusively uh, uh, litigation and counseling on federal procurement contracts, uh, grants, and related uh, uh, instruments. Today, we're going to address uh, uh, the following parts, uh, um, subparts of FAR Part 17. The first is multi-year contracting. The second is 17.2 uh, options. 17.3, um, I didn't skip it, it is reserved. 17.4 uh, is leader company contracting. Uh, uh, some of us who've been around a, a little longer than others in, in contracting uh, may, may he hear this referred to as uh, leader follower. Uh, contracting. We'll also talk about FAR Part 17.5, interagency acquisitions, uh, the related FAR 17.7, .7, which is interagency uh, acquisitions by uh, where, where the acquisition is by a non-defense agency on behalf of the Department of Defense. And then um, we will also speak about FAR Subpart 17.6, uh, which is uh, management and operating or m &O contracts. Next slide, please. One of the exciting tools and the very important aspects of FAR Part 17 is 17.1 multi-year contracting. The first thing that you want to realize uh, about multi-year contracting is that it is not the same thing as multi-year contracts, um, <clears throat> which is another term we frequently uh, come across. The key distinction between multi-year contracts and multiple-year contracts is that multi-year contracts buy more than one year's requirement of the government's uh, of, of the products or services the government seeks to acquire, without establishing or having to exercise an option for each program year after the first. So what multi-year contracting is, in terms of FAR Part 17, is a flexible special contracting method um, for uh, to acquire supplies or, or, or services for more than one year, but not more than five program years. This method can be used for uh, several different types of contracting uh, uh, methods, such as sealed bidding, 
certainly two-stepped seal, sealed bidding, uh, so your, your architectural or professional services type. Um, and then a FAR Part 15 uh, acquisition by negotiation can also use uh, multi-year contracting. Uh, it can be used with all different types of contracts, uh, although the FAR encourages contracting officers to consider fixed price uh, contracts, but with economic adjustments since you are trying to span uh, more than one contracting year. The types of things that you would want to consider uh, using a multi-year contract for uh, are are Place or, or situations where the government needs supplies or services uh, and it knows that its needs are reasonably firm and will continue over a period of time that, that goes beyond a single year or, or fiscal uh, uh, year. Um, and it, can ser it, it will serve the interests of the government by encouraging full and open competition by promoting economy in administration, performance, or operation of the agency's programs. Um, and it also can be used to broaden your competitive field because there are a lot of contractors that may not be uh, willing to look at an opportunity where their risk is on an uh, annual basis, uh, but instead want sort of the assurances and the flexibility of knowing that the government is committing for more than one uh, 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 year of contract performance. And the protection, uh, which is uh, sort of unique in the multi-year contracting, is that the contract can address contract cancellation. So you, the government does not lose its right to terminate for its convenience or for default if that's the situation, uh, but the contractor gets a little more protection than in the typical uh, um, <clears throat> multiple-year contract. Uh, because it has a, cancel, a pre negotiated cancellation arrangement. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the multi year contract will still have uh, your, your termination uh, clauses, uh, default and termination for convenience. And if, if the government overlooks the T for C clause by Christian doctrine, it'll be read in. Uh, but what's unique is this cancellation provision. Now, what's the difference between a termination for convenience of the government and a cancellation in a multi-year contract? Well, it's simply this. A T for C may be affected at any time during the life of the contract, and it can be in whole or in part. So for the entire quantity or amount of services or just a portion of them. Cancellation, though, is not at any time. Instead, it's exercised between fiscal years. And um, it, it will be for all the remaining or subsequent fiscal quantities. So all program years after the first year, so the first year doesn't, you, you won't cancel the first year, uh, are subject to cancellation. As part of the contract and contract negotiation, the government and the contractor will establish, well, the CO alone will establish a cancellation ceiling amount, and they'll figure what makes uh, uh, sense as a reasonable amount uh, for the cancellation. I do want to point out, though, that there are special procedures for using multi year contracting uh, for the Department of Defense, NASA, and the Coast Guard, and contracting officers at those agencies want to make sure. Uh, that they're familiar with those and follow those rules. Next slide. <clears throat> FAR subpart 17.2 addresses options. Now, this is something that almost all of us encounter uh, over time in uh, working in, in federal contracting or subcontracting. So here are the, the basic rules. A contracting officer can include options in contracts whenever it's in the government's best interest to do so. FAR 17.202B and C provide uh, guidance uh, to contracting officers and to the government uh, on, on instances where um, it is not generally in the government's best interest to use options. So you'll want to be familiar with those uh, rules. And if you're a contractor, also be familiar with them so that you know whether or not 
uh, you're in uh, dangerous uh, territory or whether you're being reasonable or unreasonable in seeking options. Uh, generally speaking, it's not normally in the government's interest when in the judgment of the contracting officer, uh, the foreseeable requirements involve minimum economic quantities, uh, so uh, they're large enough to permit the recovery of startup costs and the production of the required supplies at a reasonable price. Um, <clears throat> or if the contract involves delivery requirements that are far enough into the future to permit competitive acquisition, production and delivery, generally you don't want to have an option for that since you can just use uh, your full and open competition. Um, <clears throat> inclusion uh, of options uh, will not be used by contracting officer if the, uh, if the options will result in the contractor incurring undue risks. Uh, for instance, the price or availability of necessary materials or labor is not reasonably foreseeable. Uh, or if market prices for the supplies or services are likely to change substantially, um, and, and, and scenarios like that. Solicitations that contain option provisions will state the basis of evaluation of the option, uh, again, as part of that level playing field and to make sure that the government receives apple-to-apple -apple offers uh, when there's uh, uh, multiple offers or, or offerors. Uh, when and, and so uh, th that'll be things like uh, um, you know how how they want the option priced, uh, how they will calculate that price compared to the base options or unexercised options, and things like that. Obviously, offerors want to be very familiar with that because that's going to make a competitive difference uh, um, and suggest strategies as well as allows the offeror to assess the risks uh, with with its offer. When exercising an option, the contracting officer will provide written notice to the contractor within the time period that's specified in the contract. This is a really important point because uh, if the government does not strictly follow the notice requirements, uh, typically it'll be 30, 60, or, or 90 day notice of intent to exercise option. Uh, if the government doesn't abide by what the contract requires, the contractor is entitled to uh, walk and not not uh, take the option. Ordinarily, though, uh, um, as long as the government complies with the the requirements for exercising the option, it is unilateral, and the contract the contractor uh, must accept uh, the option on the terms that were in it. Now, there there are two issues I want to talk about uh, uh, because they come up very frequently with options, and that is. Um, one, does the option, can, can there be changes uh, at the time that the government exercises the option to the option uh, compared to what's written in the contract? Um, so there's really two components to analyzing that question, and it has to be done on a fact-by-fact, uh, case-by-case basis. The first is, is sort of, uh, uh, and I credit Vern uh, Edwards, a, a, a very experienced uh, uh, contracting hand um, uh, for, for dubbing this the validity issue. And basically, an option is an offer, and therefore it has to be accepted in accordance with its terms. Like any offer, the terms of an option must be reasonably definite, and the exercise has to be in accordance with those terms. The exercise of an option that is not in accordance with its terms basically is not valid, and therefore wouldn't be binding on the parties. Um, so this is the validity issue. So the government has the authority to unilaterally modify an option, uh, such as by using the changes clause or the termination for convenience if it wants to uh, um, in, uh, partially change, I guess, by removing requirements. But exercise of such authority has to be in accordance with the strict terms of the contract, including the options that are uh, in the contract and they don't prevent the exercise of the options as changed. So the parties can bilaterally agree to modify an option prior to or concurrent with its exercise, uh, which would preserve the validity. But you also have to consider what is, is sometimes called the scope of competition issue. And this is what's addressed in FAR 17.207F, 
And that is, in order to be compliant with SECA, the Competition and Contracting Act, the terms of an option when exercised have to be within the scope of the contract and the original competition. When you stop for a moment to reflect on that, it makes good sense because uh, the government based the option on the competitive field. So if it makes a significant change in the scope of the contract, it didn't achieve the competition requirements with respect to the option. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes this is referred or dovetails with the cardinal change rule. So any out of scope or cardinal change uh, uh, in a modification of an option has to be justified and approved in accordance with FAR Part 6. If it's a within scope change uh, to an option and an equitable adjustment to the option price uh, um, would not violate FAR 17.207F, to prevent exercise of the option, so that would be okay. Um, there's generally not a need to seek new competition or obtain approval of a justification uh, uh, for other than full and open um, if you're limiting any changes to within scope uh, changes and price adjustments as allowed by the contracts change uh, clause uh, uh, or T4C clause if that's what the government's going under. Now, one last issue before we move on, and that is mods to de-scope options. This comes up from time to time. Modifications to reduce the amount of work that's to be done, which might be handled as a partial T for C or deductive change order, can be tricky in a contract option scenario. This is because the Government Accountability Office has found that such mods to change the work so fundamentally as to be outside the scope of the competition, um, in other words, sort of that cardinal change concept, uh, will, will result in uh, the, the attempt to de-scope being uh, inappropriate and, and unallowed. So basically, the counsel there is talk with your counsel uh, within the agency. Uh, if you're the contractor and you're looking at a descoping with your outside counsel uh, or in-house counsel, so that any partial termination or deductive change to an option is uh, viewed in light of uh, this uh, SECA requirements and that you don't want to foul. Um, the the uh, another note, it's it's probably implicit in what we've just uh, looked at. But to, to make it clear, if the government does exercise an option with a cardinal change, uh, again, they create the scenario where the contract uh, contractor does not have to accept and move forward. Uh, they, ca they can simply reject it as now the scope change. Um, now, in real life, I realize there's a lot of uh, uh, instances where uh, a lot of this uh, it doesn't turn square corners as it should. Uh, in part because either uh, the other uh, offerors in the, in, that were in the original competitive field uh, have lost interest or they're not around or they don't police it. Uh, and so things can be done uh, not quite in sync with the regulations. Um, and, and so I know those things happen. Uh, but that's not the way it's supposed to. And certainly that's not the way I would uh, recommend. Next slide, please. A very interesting flexibility in, in FAR contracting uh, that the government has is the leader company contracting approach or method. That's in FAR subpart 17.4. As I mentioned, it's sometimes uh, referred to uh, by as leader follower contracting. It is an extraordinary acquisition technique, literally uh, called that uh, within the FAR. And it's limited to very uh, specific and, and unique or special circumstances. Um, it is, though, uh, sometimes a great way for the government to ensure that they can have multiple potential sources, even on a product or service that otherwise would generally discourage multiple sources because of things like the high uh, um, uh, cost uh, that operates as a barrier to entry uh, into the field or to the uh, extensive intellectual property and know-how that's required uh, and specialized or other factors 
that, that may make it so that ordinarily the marketplace would, would only produce uh, um, uh, one or two or very limited number of potential competitive sources. So this is a technique for the government to consider for that. We've seen it uh, uh, used on major systems, uh, contracting by the Department of Defense. Uh, I, I personally uh, uh, remember a, 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 a case, um, and I, I may be dating myself a little here, uh, but it involved a, a um, Mark 50 uh, torpedo, uh, which um, is, is was one of the last, and may still be in the Navy's inventory, uh, but, but it was not a smart munition. This was the old-fashioned, uh, the, the gunners had to know what they were doing, they had to sight and acquire the target, and they had to point that <laughs> and, uh, you know, aim it properly and, and, and fire uh, with the right lead time and timing and all that in order for the torpedo to be effective. Um, <clears throat> the, the government at one point had a, a leader-follower arrangement there, in part because of the extensive amount of actual trade secret type know-how uh, that was involved even in making that conventional uh, uh, munition. Um, <clears throat> that case uh, helped me to really appreciate that um, there, there's some important considerations that the government has to uh, keep in mind and address in any uh, arrangement that is a leader company contracting situation. Next slide, please. So the, the government can use the leader contracting method um, by either uh, uh, engaging and, and using it uh, in a prime contract that goes to uh, the, the leader company, uh, in which case the contracting officer will make sure that that prime contract obligates the leader to subcontract with uh, and provide assistance probably beyond what would normally occur in an arm's length prime sub arrangement with a follower company or multiple follower companies Again, which the government can have a significant amount of say in identifying, uh, uh, if, uh, if not directing, uh, with respect to the subs. Uh, and in turn, uh, um, the, the, the subcontractor would, would take such assistance and, and learn uh, uh, what it needs to do to eventually become a standalone independent source. Um, <clears throat> the other approach, the government can take is to have the contract with the follower company, in which case it will obligate that, that company to subcontract with a leader uh, company uh, and, and make sure that the terms of the subcontract with the leader company uh, provides for the uh, requisite assistance uh, that the leader has and is able to provide uh, um, to, to make the uh, follower uh, competent and capable eventually of providing the requirement or addressing the requirements uh, alone. Uh, what this means, and the, the, uh, one of the cases I, I mentioned uh, that, that I got familiar with, I saw this in, in uh, painstaking detail, is that the government must ensure that any contract awarded uh, using this method uh, contains a firm agreement regarding the disclosure, if any, of contractor trade secrets, not just the, the raw technical data per, uh, per se and technical designs or concepts uh, or specific technical data or software, uh, um, although there they have to pay special attention to make sure that, that the leader commits to providing uh, um, access and insights into uh, proprietary uh, tech data and software. But the trade secrets, the piece that sometimes uh, falls away because it wasn't committed uh, to a, a written or, or electronic deliverable, uh, sort of that know-how uh, that a contractor uh, obtains. Um, you, you've all probably heard the adage uh, um, that, that uh, uh, when, when you see a classic automobile, for exa example, they don't build it that way anymore. And, and the sad truth is, well, sometimes it's, it's a, a blessing, but, but the sad truth is sometimes that's true because the persons uh, who were involved in the manufacture of that on that production line came to know some trade secrets that allowed them to build uh, whatever the excellent qualities uh, of, the, of the automobile are. But that's lost when they stop 
uh, doing it, just like uh, for all of us, uh, skills diminish over time with disuse. So that's a, a, a provision that, that the government has to spay, pay a special attention to, and the leader and follower companies have to make sure uh, they get right and pay attention to as well. Next slide, please. FAR Part 17.5, uh, uh, and, and a little later we'll, we'll do a very light touch on 17.7, uh, address interagency acquisitions. So this, this is something that's of particular interest to uh, uh, the, the uh, government's contracting professionals and workforce. Uh, certainly contractors want to be aware of it, although uh, uh, you're, you're going to be a little less directly involved typically in this uh, than in uh, the options or multi-year contracting or even leader follower uh, that we've just spoken about. In 17.5, uh, uh, will apply to interagency acquisitions when an agency needing supplies or services obtains them um, using another agency's contract. Uh, so this could be, for example, uh, um, one, one agency holding a government-wide acquisition contract, a GWAC, uh, and, um, such as NASA Soup, uh, and other agencies uh, um, procuring products or services under that type of vehicle. Uh, interagency acquisitions are subject to 17.5 also when an agency uses another agency uh, to provide acquisition assistance, such as awarding and administering a contract or a task order or a delivery order. Um, it does not apply, though, to interagency reimbursable work performed by federal employees other than literally the acquisition assistance um, or interagency activities where contracting is incidental to the purpose of the transaction or orders of 550,000 or less that are issued against uh, federal supply schedules, whether it's the GSA or the VA uh, uh, federal supply schedules. Next slide, please. Probably the key takeaway at, at the level that we're, we're uh, able to go today is that interagency acquisitions under FAR 17.5 cannot be used by an agency in order to circumvent uh, conditions or limitations that are imposed on the acquiring agency uh, use of funds. So for instance, if, if you have a color of money issue and that you have funds that, that can only be used for say, uh, um, uh, um, management and operations, uh, you cannot decide that you're going to go and ask a sister agency to procure R&D using those funds uh, for you uh, so that you are not literally uh, the, the agency um, using funds incorrectly. So, so it cannot be used to sidestep fiscal law or, fan, frankly, uh, contracting uh, laws, procurement laws and regulations. It, it cannot be made uh, or used uh, for acquisitions that conflict with any other uh, of the agency's authorities or responsibilities. So, for instance, if an agency is not uh, authorized under its own rules uh, to acquire certain uh, items or services, it cannot use the interagency uh, process to circumvent that either. Sort of common sense, but uh, uh, it comes up, <laughs> so bears mentioning. Um, interagency acquisitions are commonly conducted, as I mentioned, through indefinite delivery uh, contracts, uh, such as task and delivery order contracts, um, the uh, federal supply schedules, uh, the GWACs, uh, and, and also multi-agency contracts, or MACs, are probably the, the most frequently used contractual vehicles for interagency acquisitions. And you can't talk about uh, FAR 17.5 and interagency acquisitions without talking about the Economy Act. Uh, and uh, basically, agencies have to abide by the Economy Act when they use interagency acquisitions. Guidance on this is in FAR 17.502-2. Let's go to the next slide, please.
FAR 17.6 addresses the special uh, uh, contracting method or technique known as management and operating or MNO contracting. Uh, most of you who have some experience with government contracts uh, will probably instantly think about the Department of Energy or DOE and its MNO contracts. And, and, and that, that's an appropriate and, and excellent thing to come to mind uh, because certainly the Department of Energy, uh, probably more than most other uh, federal or any other federal agency, uh, uh, very effectively uses MNO contracting uh, for, among other things, its famous uh, national laboratories. Um, this is an area that uh, is of particular interest to me uh, because literally in, in the course of my career, uh, I have seen a real evolution in the law. Um, when I first started practicing, uh, and it's not true, uh, there was already color TV and microwaves around back then, uh, but there was also something uh, in MNO contracting known as the federal norm. Uh, and uh, that, that rule has, has fallen away. We've seen the law uh, um, progress and, and uh, overtake uh, that federal norm concept. Uh, and the reason this is important is because uh, in a management and operating contract, um, what the government does is it enters into an agreement typically with private or non-federal parties uh, or, or a combination of those under which the government contracts to have or contracts for the operation, maintenance, or support on behalf of the government of a government-owned or controlled research, development, special production, or testing facility that's wholly or principally devoted to one or more major programs of the federal agency that's contracting for it. So uh, basically, you turn over the day-to-day -day operations, the management of your day-to-day -day operations to this uh, uh, private or non-federal party. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the, the national labs are, are a good uh, example of that. Um, M&O contracts are characterized by their purpose and the special relationship that necessarily gets created between the government and the contractor. <clears throat> In many instances, to a layperson entering a DOE facility on a day-to-day -day basis, they might not be able to distinguish between the contractor personnel who are running the facility and the federal employees or Department of Energy employees uh, who are also there doing their professional responsibilities. Um, and, and so that you can uh, result in a very close, tight-knit environment, which for, for the advantages uh, that might create uh, is desirable, but also creates some challenges because private employees are not government employees, and government employees generally cannot be subject to supervision by non-federal employees. Next slide, please. M&O contracts cannot be used for functions that involve the direction, supervision, or control of government personnel. That's my last point, uh, except for supervision that happens to be incidental to training. So your M&O contractor typically, as uh, one of their many uh, responsibilities, will be safety training, training uh, uh, for security, uh, training on contracting, training on uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and, and some of the, the uh, federal employees who are on the facility or have to use the facility may participate in that training. But other than incidental to training, those federal employees only report and are only subject to supervision or direction by other federal employees uh, and not by uh, the private uh, or non-federal uh, M&O contractor personnel. M&O contracts also cannot be used for functions involving the exercise of police or regulatory powers, inherently governmental functions. Uh, uh, we, we frequently see that uh, referred to uh, in the name of the government, other than uh, they can provide basic guard or plant protection services, so sort of a private police force to supplement federal uh, uh, um, security functions. Uh, M&O contracting is not used to determine basic government policies. That is inherently governmental as well. And finally, uh, M&O contracting uh, cannot be used for day-to-day -day staff or management functions 
of the agency or any of its elements or functions that can be accomplished with the use of government property uh, uh, rental uh, agreements as opposed to full uh, management and operating uh, types of contracts. Now, a couple of uh, important issues that come up frequently uh, uh, with m and contracts is the M&O contractor will go out to market and solicit uh, uh, products and services from uh, vendors of all types. And they will uh, essentially enter into uh, subcontracts with those uh, uh, vendors or subcontractors uh, for purposes that, that, that are related to the M&O uh, uh, functions. Um, those are clearly subcontracts done by and on behalf or, or, or by and behalf of the government. Again, this is an area where the law has evolved even in uh, just my couple of decades of experience. It used to be that the government or DOE, for instance, could be held responsible for the procurement actions of its m and contractors. That is not the case anymore, except in very narrow circumstances, for example, the Government Accountability Office won't decide protests that challenge subcontract awards made by an m and contractor. A recent case, that 2018, uh, um, to this uh, proposition is the Peter uh, Vanderwerf construction case, which involved the award of a subcontract by Lawrence Livermore National Security LLC, uh, which is the m and prime contractor for the Lawrence Livermore, or at the time, for the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. In that case, the, the, a, a disappointed subcontractor who did not receive one of about 15 or 16 uh, contract awards uh, from um, the m and contractor uh, protested to the GAO. And the GAO uh, ended up dismissing the protest, pointing out uh, this shift in the law that has occurred um, and, and it occurred incrementally uh, uh, since the 90s. And TAO wrote that it took jurisdiction, it, it used to take jurisdiction of subcontract awards by prime contractors to the federal government, whereas the result of the government's involvement in the award process or the contractual relationship between the prime and the government, the subcontract in effect was awarded by or on behalf of the government. And therefore, federal laws and regulations would otherwise apply. But the law started changing as early as 1991 when the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit uh, interpreted jurisdictional language similar to the jurisdiction the GAO has over bid protests. And the Federal Circuit held that the General Services Administration's Board of Contract Appeals didn't have jurisdiction over subcontract procurements conducted for a federal agency unless the prime contractor was literally a procurement agent, um, as that term is narrowly defined in, in a certain GSA authority. So since then, the GAO has narrowed its jurisdiction over subcontract protests against an m and a contractor award. And um, the GAO will only take jurisdiction over a subcontract protest uh, uh, for an award made by an m and in two instances. The first, is upon the written request of the federal agency that awarded the prime contract. And the second is where uh, the GAO finds that a subcontract essentially was not awarded for the government, but instead by the government. And with respect to that, what the GAO will look at is uh, if the subcontract procurement uh, um, was by the government because there's evidence that the agency literally handled substantially all of the substantive aspects of the procurement, um, in essence, so that the agency took over the procurement from the m and leaving the m and contractor with only procedural aspects of the procurement, such as issuing the actual subcontract solicitation or receiving proposals. So uh, an important uh, change in uh, m and contract and protests against uh, uh, subcontracts issued by m and contractors. Let's go to the next slide. And I'm actually gonna wrap up here because we talked a little bit in 17.5 about interagency acquisitions. FAR 17.7 addresses specifically interagency acquisitions 
by non-DOD agencies when they're conducted on behalf of the Department of Defense. And this part prescribes the policies and procedures that are specific to these types of, of supply and service acquisitions. It is used in conjunction with 17.5, which is why uh, I'm going to do a light touch at this point. Uh, basically, the DOD acquisition official uh, will go to the sister non-DOD agency and provide uh, to that agency uh, um, the any DOD unique terms, conditions, or other related statutes or regulations or directives that it in, uh, intends to have applicable uh, and made uh, or, or incorporated into the ultimate contract issued by the non-defense agency. And the non-defense agency will uh, uh, use those uh, and, and faithfully discharge that. So the end product looks like a DOD award, including DFARS clauses, even though the letting agency uh, uh, was uh, not subject to the DFARS itself. Next slide, please. The other uh, things to know about FAR 17.7 and interagency uh, acquisitions by non-defense agencies for defense agencies is that if there are non-DOD or no DOD unique requirements beyond what the federal acquisition regulation itself would require, the DOD official is supposed to inform its sister agency or the servicing non-defense agency as they refer to it uh, in writing. And, and that's an important internal housekeeping issue uh, for the government uh, procurement uh, um, officials. And then finally, non-defense agency contracting officers are responsible for ensuring the support provided in response to the DOD's requests comply with FAR 17.5 and 17.7. Uh, so, so while you get the direction from the DOD agency, uh, you alone shoulder the responsibility to discharge it diligently. And with that, I see we've come to the end of our time. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, I enjoyed being able to, to address FAR Part 17 and the uh, excellent tools that are, and resources available to contracting professionals in FAR Part 17. Thank you. Thanks for a great presentation, Fern. To our audience members, we thank you again for participating with us. If you have any questions about this part, please contact our speaker with the contact information you see on the screen. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.